Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session of the Harvard Medical School Organizational Ethics Consortium. I'm Charlotte Harrison. I'm one of the co-chairs of the consortium together with Kelsey Berry and Jim Sabin. Today, I have the honor to be your moderator as we hear from three experts on the ethics of hospitals as they go beyond healthcare to tackle social determinants of health inequity or decide perhaps whether they should do that. First, a warm welcome to this series. This is our first program of a full year of programs that will explore organizational ethics. The consortium is now in its eighth year, hosted by the Harvard Center for Bioethics, in which we are really aiming to support and build a learning community of practitioners and scholars around the topic of organizational ethics in health systems. We really hope you'll consider yourselves a part of this learning community and join us again for upcoming programs which I'll describe at the end of this session. Back to today. So health inequity is a one of the most persistent injustices of our time, maybe particularly salient to healthcare organizations like hospitals that are founded on the premise that health matters. Increasingly, however, evidence suggests that what hospitals traditionally do, providing clinical care, only determines roughly 20% of health outcomes. The rest is determined by things that happen outside the healthcare system. The conditions in which people live and grow, work and play, collectively referred to as the social determinants of health. And unfortunately also in the United States, the social determinants of health inequity. So should hospitals in the interest of health equity be moving toward away from their traditional role, but and toward meeting social needs in addition? If yes, then how? In thinking about this question, we'll be guided by three experts, and we look forward to he hearing each of them as they'll be speaking from ethics and management theory, as well as from experience in this area. Meanwhile, a word to, a word to the audience about your own participation in the program. There are a couple of ways to participate. One is that you can submit questions for the panelists anytime uh, using the Q&A feature. And selected questions will be discussed at the end of the panel presentation. Another way is to use the chat box to share your thoughts at any time. And those don't need to be questions. We like to have the questions in the Q&A to be sure we're seeing them in case there's a lot in the chat, but the chat is a really important expression of where the audience is, is going as you listen. And so I think people really appreciate that as well. So I hope you'll use one or both of those functions. So now I have the privilege of introducing our panelists. First, we welcome Dr. Lauren Taylor. Lauren is an assistant professor at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in the Department of Population Health. Lauren's current work explores the ethical challenges associated with managing healthcare organizations and markets. Her research has been published in academic journals such as Health Affairs, Hastings Center Report, and Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, as well as in news outlets such as the New York Times and the New Yorker. We're lucky to count her as a regular here in the consortium way, way back. She was even a member of the Office of Ethics at Children's Hospital in her student days. Uh, and we uh, have had her with us from time to time. We also welcome Dr. Kelsey Berry, whereas usually Kelsey is here in the co-chair seat with me. Uh, today, she's here to present with Lauren on some of the recent work that they've been doing together. Kelsey is a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine here at Harvard Medical School. She's also a faculty director for the master's program in bioethics. Her work in population health ethics explores just societies and the role of the healthcare system in them. Finally, we welcome Dr. Rishi Manchanda. Rishi is a, an internist and pediatrician as well as a founder and president of Health Begins, which is a social enterprise that provides training 
clinic redesign and technology to transform healthcare and the social determinants of health. Rishi's 2013 book, The Upstream Doctors, detailed a new model of healthcare workers who improve care by addressing patients' health-related social needs, such as food, financial, and housing insecurity. We're so thrilled to have the three of you with us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren and Kelsey to get us started. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, I think I'm gonna take the baton first and then Kelsey and I will tag team this a bit, but it's so good to be back in the Organizational Ethics Consortium. Um, I really do feel like this is a, in the best possible way, sort of a living room, an intellectual living room for me, where most of the projects that uh, turn out to be much of anything somehow or another get incubated here. Um, and so it's really just one of my favorite places to, to present works in progress, which this very much is. So um, let me share my screen and maybe kick us off here. Um, you know, we titled this something fairly colloquial, <laughs> which is should healthcare stay in its own lane? And we did that just to try and um, evoke a sense that this is a timely question and one that for those of you who work in health systems and in um, hospitals, you know, this is often the pushback that, you know, healthcare should stay in its own lane. And so the goal of this paper and therefore this presentation is to try and address that we think legitimate concern head on and say, you know, it's not farcical for someone to say, yeah, healthcare should stay in its own lane. Who doesn't want to be driving on a road in which everyone stays in their own lane? That sounds like the safest path forward. Uh, but we're going to try and confront that, that concern directly here. I should say before I get started, just that the last, uh, well, I think one of the times I was here, Kelsey and I were working on this paper that just came out in Hastings Center Report. And so we offer this um, only slightly self-promotionally, but more because we figured if people are coming to the table for a discussion about the appropriate role of hospitals and healthcare in quote unquote society, you might also be interested in this paper that is just out in this issue of the Hastings Center Report. Uh, you'll see the title of the paper on the screen and the title of the talk today have kind of close connections to one another. The paper on the screen is more about hospitals and healthcare systems participation in a kind of public dialogue about racial justice. And today's discussion is gonna be more about hospitals and healthcare systems getting involved programmatically in what might be called social services or um, addressing social needs. So that's the, the distinction between the two, but we see them very much as part of one coherent sort of intellectual project that frankly, Kelsey and I have been talking about now for you know, I think going on 10 years, uh, we met when we were wee babes, uh, both, I wasn't yet in the doctoral program, Kelsey was in the doctoral program, and we have been noodling on this stuff for a long time. So uh, let's get to today. So basically, this is going to be a talk in three parts. And then really, uh, maybe the best part is going to be where Rishi <laughs> layers on top and provides his comments. Uh, but the three uh, parts that Kelsey and I are going to try and do is I'm going to tee up just a tiny bit. I'm not giving you the evidence based on social determinants of health here, but a little bit about what the growth of social determinants of health programs in healthcare delivery spaces kind of looks like. And then to acknowledge again, what I said at the outset is I think a legitimate debate about whether health systems should be doing social determinants. Kelsey is our resident theorist. Uh, I will say Kelsey has an undergraduate degree in philosophy, which always makes me highly deferential to her reading of John Rawls over my own. So I'm gonna hand the baton to Kelsey and she's gonna really help us parse through the ways in which a distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory, we think can help clarify the terms of debate about whether or not healthcare should be doing this stuff and what it kind of puts forward as um, in some ways a managerial challenge. And then I'll try and close us out. Uh, you know, I've got a background in management. And so try and translate, okay, if we think this ideal, non-ideal distinction holds water and is relevant, what does that leave as the challenge for healthcare managers or healthcare executives? Then, like I said, we'll hand it off to Rishi and he'll, uh, he'll make it all make sense. <laughs> So let me just say this, um, when we think about healthcare doing some sort of social determinants of health or responsive to social needs programming, 
I've already said there's a common critique, which is healthcare should really stay in its lane. You know, just do medical care and do it well and do it for something other than an exorbitant cost. And I think there's two ways to respond to that critique. And we're going to really double down on one of them today and not the other. One way to respond to that critique is to say, this is our lane. You know, um, gun violence is our lane. Poverty is our lane. Like it's all our lane. And we should just be more expansive in our thinking about what the mandate of healthcare uh, is. That's one. The second is to say, no, look, I acknowledge that this is us going out of our quote unquote lane, but it's justified. And I don't necessarily have a view on which of these is better, but I just wanna say that we are clearly taking leave today from that second response to the critique, which is to say, yeah, we are kind of stepping out of our quote unquote lane. We're doing stuff that we may not have like ultimate expertise in, but there's reason for it. And I think again, that ideal non-ideal theory can help us in making that argument, but I just wanted to be clear about where we're taking leave from. So let me say just a word about uh, these kind of growth of programs and the resulting debate. I will say, Healthcare, of course, did not just naturally wake up one day and say, you know, social determinants of health and social needs is really important. There have for a long time, of course, been clinicians in certain healthcare organizations that have been hard at work taking an expansive view of the determinants of health and being responsive not only to medical but non-medical factors. That said, there has been a real change in the policy landscape, I think over the last 15 years that have encouraged and sometimes financially incentivized healthcare delivery systems um, to be responsive to patients' non-medical needs. That has happened at the federal level. You could think about something like the Affordable Care Act and the emphasis they were putting, or it was putting on readmissions penalty. It's now happening in lots of state policy reforms, particularly around Medicaid redesign. It's happened more locally. And then of course, some non-traditional policy actors like foundations have also really put social determinants of health or what some would call social needs into the water or the zeitgeist. And so in response, you see um, a fair bit of activity on the part of hospitals and health systems, particularly I would say in two main areas, there's a lot of activity around responding to food insecurity. And I think there's a lot of res uh, activity responding around housing related concerns. So let me say just a, a bit about food first. And maybe before I even say something about food, one of the ways in which healthcare delivery systems have opted to respond to this push to think about and address non-medical factors has of course been first to take on a large scale measurement effort. So it is becoming increasingly common for healthcare delivery systems to ask patients about their potential social needs at various points in the, in the care delivery workflow but it's on the heels of receiving this information and realizing, particularly among a Medicaid and uninsured population, although not exclusively, wow, there's a lot of social need out there. And so the policy impetus plus this big data collection effort has really, I think, created conditions for healthcare to step in and be doing some of this food stuff that I'm gonna talk about. So when healthcare delivery systems step into the fray and say, yeah, we're gonna really do something programmatically around food, you could think about the following kinds of activities. Several are setting up on-site food pharmacies, which are essentially food pantries, often with some nutritional restrictions, often on-site at the federally qualified health center or at the hospital. You could alternatively think about things like mobile markets or even some home delivered um, and potentially medically tailored uh, meals programs. I'm not gonna go into depth here, just wetting your palate so that when we're talking about healthcare doing social service delivery, you have a sense of what that might look like. I said housing is probably the second area that has a fair bit of activity in it, at least from where I sit. And so what does it look like for healthcare delivery organizations to get into housing? Well, here's some examples. Uh, right in our, our quote unquote backyard of Boston, uh, you know, Boston Medical Center led by Dr. Megan Sandell has had a really creative and robust portfolio of activities around housing, including making grants to homeless shelters, but also, um, you know, really trying to help fund the creation of new affordable housing. Uh, so if you're interested in healthcare and housing, 
uh, BMC is certainly someplace to look. Uh, you could also think about healthcare delivery systems getting involved in housing other ways by trying to cut through red tape and prioritize high need, high cost patients to make them kind of front of line to get various housing opportunities. This is not uncommon, but also not uncontroversial um, for various reasons. And then you can think about it's rare, but there are examples where healthcare is actually leading or at least supporting the effort to create new housing supply, which is really the bottleneck in a lot of the discussion around housing is, um, you know, we just don't have enough affordable and low income housing. And so uh, one very prominent example is from a CCO, which is Oregon's version of an accountable care organization, where they committed more than $10 million for the creation of new housing. I would say also that there is work in other areas that is not um, food or housing related. Workforce development would be one. I don't wanna say uh, too much about this, only to give you an example, like there is a hospital that is actually building a new workforce training center. Um, and so you can, you can understand when this stuff hits the wire, how some people say, I don't know, is that healthcare's lane? Are they experts in doing workforce training? So uh, let me just acknowledge as I have, that like there is real debate about whether health systems should be doing this kind of activity at all. And one side of the ledger kind of says, absolutely healthcare should be doing this work, right? Even if healthcare doesn't necessarily have the skills or they don't have the experience to be necessarily running a mobile market right now, health systems are really good at learning. And they're especially good at learning when you incentivize them to do things. So they'll figure it out. Additionally, you could say like, look, maybe it's not amazing that they're doing this, but we're not gonna get additional social services funding coming down the pike anytime soon. We know that government and our political climate generally is highly loath to wanna see an expansion of quote unquote welfare or safety net programs. So if we can expand some of that capacity and do it through healthcare, sounds like a good idea to me. And then the third would be to say, look like I don't care how it gets done, there's tremendous moral urgency around this. Like people living in the United States, an incredibly wealthy high income country are living without a safe place to kind of call home or rest their head at night. And we need to address that. And so one could take the view, I don't care who does it. I'm completely agnostic as to whether it's healthcare or something else. There's moral urgency and if healthcare is willing to step up to the plate, I will take it. The other side of the ledger, is kind of this absolutely not, <laughs> which is to say, you know, really double down on this is not healthcare's expertise. Anything that healthcare does winds up hugely expensive, right? Because they're complicated systems and there's just, so, no matter what they do, you know, you ask for penicillin from CVS and it costs $1.380, you get it from the hospital, it costs 15 bucks. So is that the path we wanna go down for these social services? And then you could also have a more kind of political economy concern, which is to say, I don't wanna give healthcare this kind of power and control, right? Like Lauren, you just told me that in Colorado, some healthcare delivery systems are getting into the housing game by putting some additional priority on high need, high cost patients to get housing over other kinds of people who just happen not to be high need, high cost. And that makes me very uncomfortable. And I don't want to cede that kind of power over important decisions that are not strictly medical to the healthcare delivery system. These are the two sides of the debate. I hope I've made clear that um, they both have parts of them where I won't speak for you, but for me, they both have parts of them that are compelling. And that's what motivates me to really wanna take this on. I'm gonna say just one thing here and tee it up for Kelsey to take over, but um, in responding to this question, should healthcare systems be doing social determinants of health? Our take is that a distinction between reasoning towards an ideal world and reasoning in a non-ideal world can be clarifying. And I would say kind of our thesis to preview the argument is, look, in an ideal world, we think health systems are not the first best option for providing food, housing, et cetera. Full stop. But in a non-ideal world, which is very much the world that we live in, it is corrupt, it is unjust, it is fallen in the theological sense. 
we think health systems efforts to respond to the moral urgency of social needs can be consistent with justice. And so this is a way not just to placate both sides of this argument, but to take seriously that both of them are offering insight and that they can live uh, in some kind of harmony with one another. So with that, I'm going to uh, shift over to Kelsey's voice and uh, ask her to take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so I guess, you know, quick summary, hospitals are doing a lot to get into the social determinants of health game, and some say yay and others say nay. And there is nothing like an impasse to impede progress that could be beneficial um, on all accounts. So the first thing that we really wanted to do in kind of turning to this ideal and non-ideal theory distinction is just to say that there's value in recognizing that neither perspective is invalid. Um, and ethical theory can really help us see that. And then secondly, if we're able to put these two perspectives in hand with one another, we can actually be more strategic in our efforts, efforts towards justice. Um, so we're gonna take a brief detour into theory to lay a little bit of groundwork um, and specifically, we're going to pick up on this distinction that's drawn by John Rawls in his work on justice between ideal and non-ideal justice theory to kind of orient us. And actually, Lauren, if you would advance one more, I think I'm going to start with ideal theory because yeah. um, that's, well, you'll see why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so let's just, we'll start with ideal theory and sorry about all the text, but um, focus your eyes on the right side of this slide with me for a moment. Um, this is really what Rawls spent a lot of his time developing. Um, and so here the focus is really on kind of visioning the world as it ought to be and the rules that would govern in that ideal world. Um, and so those rules usually assume full compliance, right? Which means that the people who live under them are fully adherent to them. They, they exist, first of all, and that people actually adhere to them. And so the natural conclusion in this frame is that if we were now to meet the assumption of full compliance, right, everyone simply does what they are supposed to do, then poof, right, we would find ourselves in exactly the kind of world that we're aiming for. Um, so now that's kind of really starting to frame up a good reason not to take it upon oneself to do something rogue, right? step outside of your lane as sometimes critics of hospitals engaging in social determinants of health projects would caution. Because then even as well-intentioned, right, as that effort might be, you risk becoming part of the problem, right? Putting another um, kink in a kind of tangled social web that has really prevented us from meeting uh, a lot of our goals. So, and maybe one more quick, Lauren. Uh, Yes, there we go. Okay, so now ideal theory, um, it's incredibly useful. It's really no small task to figure out what ideally we're aiming for in society, what a just society actually looks like. Um, 300 plus years of political philosophy have tried to do this. Uh, and that's really the task that ideal theory takes upon itself is to clarify what is this desired end state? Where do we want to be ideally? Um, and yet, the critics would say that by making some of these idealizing assumptions as part of its methods, right? For example, about full compliance with the rules um, or even abstracting away from some of the things that we know to be true, right? The non-ideal circumstances in which we live. Ideal theory is really setting out this very lofty and perhaps too lofty goal um, without giving us more useful guidance than saying something like, well, just do what you're supposed to do, ideally, and all will be well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the critique, right, of this project of non-ideal theory. But on the other hand, so that kind of pushes us and has really pushed a lot of dialogue and political philosophy over the past few decades towards a non-ideal lens, uh, which really traditionally re rejects a focus on what they call a dream world, right? The dream world of ideal theory um, and what it looks like and how that dream world runs and zeroes in instead on the world that is right in front of us, right? All of the ways that we are falling down, right? On our obligations. And so the common assumption that non-ideal theory is making is that we are not only 
non-compliant with rules of justice, but we're likely going to continue to be non-compliant with them. And so what we actually need are some principles to guide our actions that assume these failings and help us make more pragmatic solutions, help those who are willing to make more pragmatic solutions for the world as it is. So that is the terrain and the work of non-ideal theory. It works out what duties and obligations apply to us in these situations of partial compliance. Um, so if we know right, that people who should be helping the poor or gr groups that should be avoiding discrimination on the basis of race aren't doing those things and won't likely be doing those things for a while, then what do we do from there? It is not hard to see, and we're, sorry, just jump back one more, Lauren, sorry. Uh, this, is the, this is the challenge of our being, <laughs> of our sharing slides. Um, so it's not hard to see the allure of this approach, right? The fact that everyone's acted um, imperfectly, many people have acted imperfectly over time, and in fact are even acting imperfectly now, means that a lot of deviations from the ideal have been stamped on our communities and our laws and on our bodies. And so we have quite a lot of that residue to make up for, to make the world better, let alone ideal. Um, so we need to have some guidance about how to proceed from the circumstances in which we st stand. And non-ideal theory therefore gives us a pretty good reason, right, to change tact as a hospital, to get working on social determinants of health. Because in the real world, right, contrary to what an ideal perspective might suggest, as a hospital, I can't simply focus on healthcare and expect health equity to pop out of thin air, right? I would need a lot more to be happening around me for that really to be the case. And so non-ideal theory is giving us that needed dose of um, realism. The limitation, and this is just the last bullet on that left-hand side, is that when we inject this realism into our kind of normative theorizing, right, and we assume the persistence of this widespread social failure, we risk yielding goals and prescriptions that might fall short of our broadest and fullest conceptions of what health equity actually is. So what emerges from non-ideal theory at its worst is this kind of take what we can get narrative where the more facts we incorporate about our limitations, our flaws, our non-compliance, the more that the principles we end up with can offer this uncritical acceptance of how we are of the status quo, right? Instead of pushing us further. So the trick here, and the reason that we put both of these on the table is that they are in tension with one another. And you can see how they support kind of the two perspectives that Lauren was sharing with us earlier. But the trick is not to live exclusively in either of these two worlds, but instead to find a way to bridge them. Um, and so that really brings us to the next slide with this kind of transitional view of non-ideal justice. Um, some think, right, of justice in our non-ideal world as it exists, not as requiring us to lower our sights in this kind of remedial way, right, that non-ideal theory might suggest, or even acting kind of impotently as if everything is just fine, as a more ideal lens would suggest, but actually in this transitional view, which knits the two ideas together, where ideal theory is really setting out on a project of defining the end state, right? Setting out this long-term goal. And then the task in the project of non-ideal theory is not to set our goals lower or to assume, right? That we're never gonna get better, but rather to look at how to gradually approach that long-term goal through smaller incremental steps. And so on the next slide, there are some benefits to relating the two perspectives in this way, in a kind of complementary rather than antagonistic manner. First of all, right, this approach of transitional, transitionally viewing non-ideal justice, it um, does not rule out actions on the grounds that they are not fully ideal, right? So it allows for a deviation from whatever the ideal set of rules would be. And that helps us avoid making the perfect the enemy of the good. Okay, but then also it doesn't give up the ideal altogether, right? It still works it in. 
So by appealing to this idea of what we ideally want, that end state, it helps us avoid lowering our, lowering our standards to this kind of anything better than status quo goes, okay? So with those kind of like big framing ideas in mind, we could ask the question, well, what does this transitional view really have to say? Right? What guidance does it offer us um, in the kind of concrete or the practical? And so that's where we get to um, what have been called transitional constraints, right? So some ideas about um, what a good policy in this transition from the non-ideal to the ideal looks like. So we turn actually to Rawls again um, in this, it, it's by way of John Simmons, who is a kind of contemporary interpreter um, of Rawls's work and who really reminds us that Rawls wrote a lot of things and some of the less productive views of ideal versus non-ideal theory actually are in his biggest magnum opus that puts them in tension with each other in this kind of antagonistic way. Whereas in his Law of Peoples, which is another book that looks at international order, he really fleshes out these ideas of transitional justice connecting the two. Um, and so what he says, right, is that a good policy in non-ideal theory is good as transitionally just. That is, as a morally permissible part of a feasible overall program to achieve perfect justice, as a policy that is going to put us on an improved position to reach that ultimate goal. And so that's pulling out three desiderata against which to evaluate hospital participation in social determinants of health. So on the next slide, I've just listed these three. Um, so the specific approach would have to be morally permissible, politically possible or feasible, it's another way of talking about it, and likely to be effective. Now, I will concede there are um, just endless things to say about each one of these transitional constraints and what it contains and how to analyze it and maybe even critique it. So I just want to give you a quick flavor of how this gives us a little bit of guidance in thinking through or in helping hospitals, perhaps, think through how they might approach social determinants of health. So I'll just start with this kind of moral permissibility criterion. Um, on one level, we could understand it very simply, which is to say not, we don't wanna be engaging in kind of activities that are obviously impermissible, right? So you could imagine achieving a just social order really quickly by starting a civil war that causes the death of a lot of innocents. Um, that is not what hospitals are doing. <laughs> we know that, um, but, there, but you can kind of use a relatively basic moral sense to say, no, there are just some things, right? Like murder. Um, that are not appropriate policy approaches to moving us to a more just state, even if they might do it relatively quickly, okay? Um, so then to get a little bit more nuanced, we might also be considering how the initiatives that we undertake on this kind of path to a better world um, might have some transitional unfairness in them. You know, so people live under a, an expectation of certain rules and activities happening in society, right? They kind of build their lives under what's going on. And so when things change, right? For example, when a new actor becomes involved in an activity that they have not traditionally been involved in, we want to be thoughtful about the way that that might pull the rug out from other people who built their lives innocently, right? On a different set of assumptions. And so thinking about transitional unfairness as we move forward with policies to try to get us to an end goal. And then just thirdly, and this one maybe seems a little bit obvious, right? Is to not commit a more grievous injustice in the service of progress on a less grievous injustice. So I won't say very much about that um, because it might seem kind of intuitive. We don't wanna be trading off things that are worse um, to get to things that are better. Is that, did that make sense? We can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, now I will say the, um, those, those are interesting moral constraints. Um, there are also these other ideas that Rawls is introducing, um, that Simmons introduces by way of Rawls, uh, which is that we should pursue policies that are not only morally permissible, yes, but also possible and likely to be effective. And so you might be saying to yourself, well, we don't necessarily need, we need something other than philosophy to answer these questions. 
um, we need, you know, economics, we need social scientists, we need some good measurements, um, and some good predictive modeling, which is all true. Okay. But philosophy does have something to offer us on this, uh, on this terrain in terms of clarifying what success is, right, so that we can measure against that view of success in the policies that we're considering. Um, so we could either, we can think of kind of two ways of measuring success. One would be, how well does this policy do against a narrower, narrower goal, um, eliminating a specific injustice, right? So for example, meeting the needs of individuals who are food insecure. Um, a second way of assessing a policy is as it relates to this ultimate goal, right? The overall achievement of perfect justice. And transitional theory focuses us on the latter. Not to say that the former is not important, but it really says we need to be thinking carefully about the latter. So it's gonna caution us against choosing policies that only remedy a particular injustice now, but would set back efforts to achieve justice more in the future. So it's really this idea of identifying moral opportunity costs of what we choose to do. So in terms of potential ideal justice delayed, we wanna be thinking about whether our policies make it harder for us to make progress going forward. Um, it has a unique implication actually to prioritize this longer term goal and to really think about how what we're doing gets us to that path, which is to say that if we want to put ourselves in the best possible position to make that progress, it might mean accepting worse before better, right? So we all know and have, can see in our own lives in many ways that progress is not necessarily linear, right? A policy might take one step backward, give up something that is good, that is working in order to take five steps forward later on. And that would be more transitionally just according to this account, right? Than just taking two steps forward now and stuttering. So, with these kind of ideas in mind, I think that um, they're open to critique in some ways, but I also think they help shape our thinking about what hospitals and other healthcare organizations could be attentive to when they're thinking about whether and how to approach work on social determinants of health. And so to give um, a little bit more uh, teeth to that idea, I'll turn it back to Lauren. Um, to make the translation to how this might play in a managerial space. Thanks, Kelsey. I'm just sitting here grinning. It's so fun to work with you. You're so smart. Okay, uh, let me try and bring home some managerial implications of recognizing a non-ideal, a strategy born in non-ideal theory um, as a transition state <laughs> to try and get us to something more ideal. So basically my thought on how managers in health systems could make use of this set of philosophical uh, principles is to say like managers should basically be wearing bifocal lenses <laughs> and they should wear bifocal lenses in the sense that, you know, standard bifocal lets you see near and it lets you see distance through different parts of the lens. And my sense is um, I'd like to invite healthcare managers to be um, facile in moving between these worlds. That is, they've got a part of their lens that sees the world as it is and is crafting strategy to be responsive to the moral urgency in the world as it is, but they can also raise their vision a bit and see the world as it should be and make sure that the action they're taking to respond to the world as it is, is consistent, as Kelsey was telling us, with the longer term goals of bringing the world as it should be into fruition. So that's the general kind of managerial takeaway. Let me say a little bit about how I think that can be quite tricky. So let's think about how health system managers typically think. Um, and you could imagine uh, a health system undertaking some kind of, let's say, food pantry services. And so what does success on programs like this typically look like? It looks like kind of monotonic growth or improvement, right? in potentially a various array of statistics. So the manager could say like, we're gonna do this food pantry thing and I wanna see numbers on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. I wanna see how many people are getting screened and screening positive. 
I want to see how many patients get referred to the pantry, and then I want to know how many people who get referred to the pantry are actually getting services. And you know, you would do some stuff and then classic management, you kind of plan, do, study, act, you'd refine the intervention and you'd do some more stuff, and you'd refine it and then you'd do some more stuff. But essentially you would count as success, like I said, monotonic improvement, right? So in this kind of stylized example, I've got, you know, more patients getting screened, uh, more patients proportionally receiving food, and, or sorry, more patients being referred to food and then more patients receiving food. And you ultimately hit an asymptote on this bottom right square where everyone who gets referred to the pantry receives services. And so this is where I think, you know, if I were to just bring my HBS colleagues to the discussion, they would say this, this right here is success. And I think one way to kind of dig into this is to say, well, when you count this as a win, you are implicitly making the following assumption of a lot of people who would otherwise not have received food are receiving food because of the program we have started here at Hospital X, which is a basic human right. So like we have done a really good thing here. The critique of course is this is a loss. Health systems are now getting to determine who is deserving of food and who gets access to their fancy food pantry. And, you know, their view of who's deserving is too narrow compared to another entity undertaking this work. The other entity might be a community-based organization who's been at this for decades, if not centuries, right? And so what I'd like to say, this is just me graphing those little statistics before uh, the provision of social services on the y-axis and time on the x-axis is, you know, if you think only about the world as it is, meaning you were to exclusively take that non-ideal theory lens, you would kind of say like, set it and forget it at this point. Uh, health systems have successfully learned how to do this particular kind of social service provision and uh, we have succeeded and good on us and good for the world because folks are getting food. But the other thing that I would like to say about this kind of bifocal lens for managers is the really tricky part is that performance needs to be able to be judged against both the non-ideal and the ideal benchmarks, potentially at different parts of the strategy. Meaning if we really take non-ideal theory as a transitional theory, trying to get us to a more ideal world, well, then we should be judging our performance against non-ideal benchmarks early in the strategy, and we should be judging it against ideal benchmarks later in the strategy. So what does that look like visually? You know, as I showed you before, you could say these X and Y axes are exactly the same. You could say, look, like we learned a lot and we increased our social service provision at hospital X in the sort of near to medium term. But what we really ought to be doing over the medium to long term in taking seriously ideal theory is to say like, we should be trying to get out of this game because in an ideal sense, where everyone is compliant with the role to which they are like accorded in society, you know, the critics have it right. Maybe healthcare shouldn't be the one over the long term providing social services like food and, food and housing and workforce. So where that would leave us is to say, potentially a really sophisticated healthcare strategy around SDOH engagement is to recognize there is moral urgency now that we are at least permitted, maybe not required, but permitted to respond to. And that that's not a crazy idea and it's not morally impermissible. So healthcare delivery organizations can start these programs. They can even scale them in the near to medium term, but they should do so with a very clear idea that this is not their work forever or it shouldn't be their work forever. That other entities should ideally come in and be able to take on that role. There's a debate about whether those entities exist at the appropriate scale right now. And that's in some ways an empirical discussion, but at least to recognize that over the medium to long term, ideally, healthcare delivery should be doing healthcare delivery and other organizations should be doing other kinds of social determinant and social service work. The last thing I want to say is, so this is health system performance. You know, you could see, you could think about the role for health systems in this work increasing and then ultimately decreasing. 
And that's in part because ideally we would want to see these non-health system actors coming in to really take the lead on this social service kind of work. And so perhaps this is too abstract, but this is visually how I think about the transitional state and the way in which you move from non-ideal theory to ideal theory through the lens of kind of a strategist, if you will. I just wanna say the hardest part about this, if I put myself in the shoes of a healthcare CEO or um, other strategist is to know, make a judgment call about when to shift their lenses. Meaning, all right, Lauren, I hear you. We're gonna undertake some social service delivery to respond to the moral urgency and take the world as it is. That'll be an activity premised on nine ideal theory. But then like, when do I shift my gaze? When do I decide that we should start pulling back rather than expanding the scope or scale of what we do around social services? And I will say, this is something where I have very little to offer by way of like real practical guidance. All I can say is that is a judgment call and it's a tough one. Um, and without more specifics, I don't know how to offer more guidance either here or in a paper about when that shift in lenses should ultimately occur. Uh, I just wanted to call it out here that like real shift in interpretive lenses would really happen in a kind of stylized sense at the point in which non-health system actors are either ready or are in fact taking on a larger burden of social service provision than our health systems. So to recap this, you know, uh, and I'll ask Kelsey to weigh in on this recap as well, but I think what we've tried to say is, look, the question of whether or not hospitals should be doing SDOH is reasonably contested, but we think separating out ideal and non-ideal circumstances can facilitate some convergence by saying like, look, Non-ideal, healthcare maybe can and should be doing stuff. Ideal, healthcare probably shouldn't be doing stuff. And we need to come up with a transition plan from one to the other. That's the most sophisticated way to be discussing this issue rather than just me looking at Rishi saying, oh, Rishi, you're so naive for thinking that healthcare should do this. And Rishi looking at me and saying, oh, Lauren, you're so cold-hearted by thinking that healthcare should not be doing this. We've suggested taking this kind of bifocal approach where you can focus both on kind of responding to the moral urgency and bringing to fruition this more just state. And I'll turn it to Kelsey. Any final thoughts before we let Rishi weigh in? I couldn't say anything more than what you have already done. So I am so, <laughs> I, I love, I love working with you, Lauren. So Rishi, why don't you jump in? We're curious. Um, we're curious about your thoughts. This is a work in progress for us. Um, and so there's a very real chance that anything that we're asked or, or um, uh, comments will find their way into hopefully a refined um, version of something like this, or even tell us that we're on the wrong, wrong track too. Yeah, thanks Kelsey and thanks Lauren. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful stuff to kind of react against. And I think the, if the primary objective is, I think you both put it, was to present this as a lens to help clarify discussions about what roles and responsibilities lie within healthcare and outside of it. Uh, I, I certainly feel like this has been clarifying for me. So let me put on my progressive lenses and say that <laughs> as a, um, that perhaps if I'm understanding, and again, I'm not a philosopher nor do I report to play one on TV, uh, the transitional lens on non-ideal justice, if I got that right as you're presenting it, um, it, almost calls for a progressive lens kind of analysis where there is uh, the ability to kind of stay in between these spaces, because that's really what resonates with me the, as I was listening to you all. I'm a primary care and public health trained physician. I've spent the bulk of my career working in communities that have been historically marginalized and socially um, harmed by by structural practices and policies. Uh, South Central Los Angeles at an FQHC for several years where I was a primary care clinician and started a social medicine program at the VA, um, building clinics to help care for homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. And in the Central Valley where I um, helped build and lead clinics and other community programs to uh, improve outcomes for farm workers. Um, so when I hear the discussion today, I keep, I, I keep thinking about a few different questions. And so let me, let me um, share my remarks maybe in the context of about 10 minutes. If I have about 10 minutes, 12, I'll try you to keep go, it. Rishi, whatever I'll, you have to hear, whatever you have to say, I'm here for it. 
So the first question is actually, um, I was thinking about, you know, who is at the center of the, um, the discourse here and you know, the, uh, your, the manager implications, I think really kind of clarified that for me. It's, it's meant to be you know, trying to answer questions for the strategists, the CEOs, the managers of large healthcare systems. And I, I just want to bring in a, a contrasting kind of frame of reference. Um, a couple months ago, I was in the home of a woman named Erlinda Erheta. Uh, Erlinda uh, is in her late 50s. She has complex um, medical and social needs, um, several chronic illnesses, including hypertension and diabetes, sleep apnea, um, and persistent severe asthma. Um, her provider had, um, her clinician had prescribed a CPAP machine, a machine to help her breathe at night, obviously because of her sleep apnea. And this was imperative, not just for the sleep apnea, but for her health overall. The healthcare delivery apparatus essentially had prescribed her a device as part of her therapeutic treatment plan to help care for this obvious medical need. Um, I met her in her home, and her home was um, one that had been plagued by a severe, chronic, persistent infestation of roaches, bed bugs, water leaks, and concomitant kind of problems with mold. Um, she herself, because of mobility issues uh, related to her medical issues, had uh, problems in terms of being able to get in and, and, as importantly, out of this hazardous environment in which she was living. Uh, when I met her, I asked her, you know, how these conditions are affecting her. And she said, go take a look at my CPAP machine. And so I went to go look at her CPAP machine and saw immediately what, why she asked me to go look at it. Because as I looked at this machine, which she had told me she had been cleaning rigorously every night, every day, cleaning, keeping as well maintained as possible, having just cleaned it a few hours earlier, she said, now take a look and tell me if you see anything. Again, she directed me to go to her bedroom because she couldn't get up. Uh, it was just too much to, she would get winded. So I went. And I looked underneath the cover of the CPAP machine, took it off, and there were roaches. One roach sitting right there on her CPAP machine, and one just in the mouthpiece, essentially, that she would put on her nose. And just for a moment, center the conversation about this debate, about the role, right, for healthcare to address social determinants of health in the context of Relinda. She had tried for weeks and weeks to try to contact her provider to be able to get a new CPAP machine. She finally was successful, and yet having gotten that machine, she went back in and put that in the same context, right? Whose lane is it? <laughs> right? It was not a question I was concerned with at that moment right there. And that's not because of my clinical training or my public health training, but because of like the basic reality of in a non-ideal state, perhaps, <laughs> right? This was clearly um, hazardous to her health. And so I want to keep her Linda in mind as I ask a couple of framing questions as I go through today. One is, um, and I'm gonna peel the onion a little bit if I can and try to apply a progressive, a set of progressive lenses uh, to this maybe living in that transitional view they described. First, let's define terms um, as, as it was coming up for me. The term SDOH has been successfully um, co-opted by healthcare to mean something that it was not meant to be. And so uh, it sets us back actually in thinking about what's in lane, what's out of lane in roles. You've alluded to this in the discussion today, and I think it's actually really important to underscore this point in the discourse and the dialogues that I'm a part of in our work at Health Begins, the organization I founded, and we now um, do work across the country. We are a design implementation partner helping healthcare systems and community partners work together to design strategy, to manage programs, big, bold interventions to improve health equity, and effectively to uh, move upstream in order to advance health equity. What's implied in that is the recognition of the social and the structural drivers of health equity, a term that I use repeatedly in our work, the social and the structural drivers of health equity. There's two things that are really important in terms of terms and definitions. One, it recognizes that equity itself, as we define it in our work using an ethical frame, is an ethical value grounded in an ethical principle of distributive justice. So justice is a clear kind of you know, lens over here. And I, I was looking for that and thinking about that as you were um, talking about the political philosophy discourse, the Rawlsian kind of analysis there. Um, in, in our work, as we think about that equity uh, framing, which is grounded again in these ethical principles of distributive justice, what's right, wrong, normative kind of questions, um, how is how resources distributed or not, what we then say is, well, let's look at the ways in which different social and structural drivers actually uh, represent and perpetuate inequities. 
at the individual level, it manifests as social needs, social risk factors. There's a discuss dis discussion about those terms, and that's food insecurity. So that's, in Erlinda's case, that would be housing insecurity and exposure to unsafe housing conditions. But beyond that, there are social determinants of health and the way that the frame uh, we use, consistent, I think, with the public health kind of literature and the WHO and others, um, trying to push back against the way in which healthcare has effectively co-opted this term. Health, social determinants of health really mean community level kind of phenomena defining the conditions that give rise to the social needs, right? So if it's food insecurity at the individual level, food deserts. And then lastly, why are those food deserts there in the first place? Why are those social determinants there in the first place? What shapes those? What influences those? Those are the structural determinants of health equity. I'm going to use that framing because it's not just a terminology debate, but it's because it informs the rest of my comments about now not beyond terms to the next question, which is maybe talking a little bit more about what activities are being debated and when, when folks are bringing up this, is it in our lane or not kind of debate. I often pause and say, well, let's get really clear. Like, what do you consider to be in your lane? What are you, what are you really kind of contesting here? And in dialogues we've had in roundtables across the country with stakeholders, as well as in one-on-one -on -one conversations with a lot of clients, what we uh, usually encounter is a, a degree of consensus around the fact that healthcare, our, our lane, if you will, in healthcare is to provide the best, most accessible and most equitable care demonstrated by outcomes. Like in our care delivery itself has to be the, the best quality. This is the triple aim, quadruple aim, now potentially the quintuple aim defined. And there's increasing um, uh, discussion now, and in, in some cases in the space of work and a lot of consensus that this has to include now very explicitly being able to, as part of care delivery, improve equity. Where there's more contestation, but it's still being actively contested is whether healthcare has a role beyond that. And this is where I think you're your paper you referred to gets to the kind of maybe civic responsibility role in the way you're describing it. But you know, what does it mean for the institution now to, for example, in its own hiring practices, in its own, in the way it treats its own employees, not perpetuate inequities, including racial inequities, not create social needs like food insecurity among your own staff while you're trying to ostensibly screen for it and your patients. There are institutional kind of policies and then beyond that, what does it mean as an institutional actor in your community to address the food desert, to address the, the food apartheid at a structural level? Those are being contested, no doubt. Defining these terms separately allows us to actually have the debate in clearer ways. Like, are we talking about addressing social needs in order to optimize care? Or are we talking about food deserts in order to kind of contest your institutional kind of roles? That term definition really helps to cut through and define what activities for the, for today, it sounds very much like we're talking about care delivery. And I wanna just clarify that because what I was hearing was something implied. I think what you're contesting is whether healthcare should be providing social goods, um, social addressing social needs, like providing food, providing housing. And what I want to contest then is this, that um, when we think about the specific activities, we can also then move on to the next thing about specific roles. And what we learned time and again in healthcare, as for example, we looked at behavioral health, um, where we started screening just recently in, in this generation, we started screening and adopting as normal, quote unquote, in our lane, the idea of screening for depression or for mental health. This was contested or at least unaddressed. It was not in our quote unquote lane in the biomedical kind of view to do that. And what we've realized is, and as you expand the aperture of what is considered normal in our lane in healthcare, we've also seen people reconcile this non-ideal or transitional kind of view by essentially saying, well, maybe it's not about leading or not. It's really about lead, partner, or support. Team-based care is the transition away from the cowboy model for a reason, because it's more effective and efficient. It's the way in which we've strategically and operationally solved for this philosophical debate, which really doesn't really manifest a lot. This idea of being able to identify how we lead, partner, support is something we've done time and again to integrate behavioral health needs, to be able to address a variety of needs for a diverse and complex patient population. Care delivery, in other words, it rests on a team-based care model. And so when we apply that team-based care approach in which some people lead, some people partner, and some people support, and sometimes those roles shift depending on the topic, a behavioral health um, a care manager leads behavioral health care management, while a physician may lead the, uh, the prescribing of a particular you know, adjustment of treatment plan. Everybody has different roles to lead and everybody has different roles where they support partner and support. The same thing we apply here, and I think it can help unlock this question because um, in my day-to-day -day practice and working with um, you know, hospitals and leaders across the country as well as frontline folks, when we think of Berlinda, we don't have time. And it feels entirely relevant to debate whether or not we're going to figure out, you know, should we step outside the apartment building now and say, well, my job, your job, no. It's really about more efficiently saying, 
who's, who's lead here, who's partnering, who's supporting. And in some communities where the social infrastructure and the healthcare infrastructure has been um, devastated because of longstanding structural practices, sometimes it's the first to kind of see that issue, sometimes healthcare because of the ground role, where we have to at least be the first to identify if there's a need, we're sometimes the first to identify whether the need exists or not. That's different from screening, in other words, is different from implying that we have to be the always the people who provide right, the remediation for the housing. But it does require us to at least figure out whether we are going to lead. If not lead, then who are we going to partner with and how can we support? We have to identify a role on a team, you know, and when it comes to addressing patient social needs, um, rather than um, being caught in debate about whether we lead or not. Right? It's, if we can't lead, then who else is leading here and how do we find that out? And when we do that, that raises another question, which is, um, you know, in our lanes, I, come, I thought of the, the, the great kind of thing that was in the, in the chat here. Um, who put this? Tim put in this link for the KKTV kind of thing with this beautiful picture of these kind of lanes with weird road markings. It made me realize a couple of things. One, these lanes are being kind of, like, who's defining the lane? And, and as importantly, um, what's happening with social needs in particular is healthcare is starting to realize, wait a second, there are other cars on this road. There's other vehicles on this road. For the first time, this large behemoth of an industry is starting to realize, wait a second, the, uh, maybe when it comes to social needs and social determinants, there are other bikes on the road next to our giant tractor trailer. <laughs> we should be more cautious about how we kind of navigate this road together. How do we actually make sure that it's not just about whether it's in our lane or not. From, from my perspective is how do you make sure as a healthcare system, you're not, you're not <laughs> causing violence on the road and running bikes off the road, the social sector off the road. In that way, and that does require, I think, um, more cognizance of the fact that this is a lead partner support environment. It's, it's not about if we the debate about whether it's in my lane or not often speaks to, I think, the navel gazing that healthcare is, is does a lot, which is it's about us. It's about us. It's about us. <laughs> it's not. There are other cars and vehicles on the road, and so we should just figure out how to like uh, figure out whether we're actually in their lane or not. And if 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 they ask us to say, hey, you know, for for this particular patient, for Linda. Can you tell us if she has any kind of problems with roaches in her CPAP machine? And if so, we got your back. We got that. We'll take it. Now we're at, now we're problem solving in a way that makes sense. It raises uh, two other last good questions here, and this is about um, I'm going to get now deeper into the kind of critique in a bigger way. For me, the this definition of the ideal state, one in which healthcare doesn't or shouldn't do anything related to social needs, specifically providing social services. In practice, what I've seen when this debate gets raised, it's often um, revealing a deeper flawed belief that health is some sort of a biomedical construct, right? And that ergo healthcare itself should be a biomedical enterprise. And from my perspective, anybody who spent a minute caring for a person, whether as a healthcare provider or a social services and a provider, knows that health is a biopsychosocial state. We know this. We know this intrinsically, inherently. It just takes a moment to interact with a person uh, in a, in a, with a responsibility to do that. Um, and as such, the question really is this. I think what this debate often fails to acknowledge is that um, there is no neutral benevolent position which, or neutral position in which healthcare is starting from. What I'll argue is that what we're talking about here is a scenario in which if, if we recognize most of healthcare is accepting a biomedical perspective, where in reality health is a biopsychosocial kind of phenomenon, most of what we're doing, especially in the story of Arlinda, is providing mediocre substandard care and trying to defend our right to provide that. The reality um, is that we have plenty of experience going back decades, especially looking at populations of patients who have various complex, complex needs, including social needs. HIV, um, the HIV AIDS um, epidemic itself taught us that we needed to develop new models of care that were what? Biopsychosocial. Adolescent care, biopsychosocial. There's whole screening assessments. Taking care of homeless patients and populations, biopsychosocial models. Um, as we, the PACE model, right, for geriatric care, we have deep experience recognizing that the best and the highest standards of care actually come when we, when we try to recognize and then create models to address the biopsychosocial phenomenon of health. And what I'd argue is because healthcare is not defined that way, what, what we're really, the debate between whether it's myelin or not really is in fact an indictment of the fact that healthcare has for, for too long been um, allowed to get away with what has been permissible morally or uh, otherwise has been providing substandard care. And so I contest that that um, what we're really talking about is whether um, it's not so much about whether it's in our lane or not, it's really about whether the care that we're providing is the best standard of care or not. 
and um, I've written about this and, and what I see, um, I, I speak passionately about this because of the stories of providers who do this, who are at the front lines of this question, meeting with patients like Erlinda. And I can't tell you how many people cry, not patients, providers, when they get a glimpse of a biopsychosocial model of care in which they've at least played a role in helping to identify and maybe whether leading, partnering or supporting efforts to address that social need. When a patient with diabetes and insulin requirements comes in time and again to your clinic and you don't know how to kind of take care of the problem that they really have, which is a lack of a fridge to store their insulin. And all of a sudden you find out in some way you have participated in an ecosystem, an integrated model of care to do that. Tears flow. I've seen this. Providers who have known their patients sometimes for decades, all of a sudden realizing that their patient, somebody they cared about deeply, has had, had food insecurity. They never knew about it. And that there's something that somebody in the community can do about it. Tears, right? And that's a reflection of the moral injury that we allow to be the permissible standard right now in healthcare. That providers consistently are put in a situation where they're asked to operate in a biomedical model uh, without being able to have the tools to address the biopsychosocial kind of context. It doesn't mean that healthcare has to do it all, but we have to recognize that healthcare is complicit in perpetuating the biomedical model in substandard care. And the last thing is this, this reveals for me, this the stay in your lane versus this is my lane debate often reveals, and I really love the transitional view, the non-ideal kind of um, lens of, uh, that you've presented here, because I'm gonna be thinking about this and using the bifocal lens and the progressive lenses as part of my talks. No doubt, this is clarifying for me in a huge way. One of the things I'll just, add though is that many times this reveal these debates and the discourses I see at the managerial levels where it tends to have more space it doesn't really show up so much at the practitioner level as it shows up in different ways it's usually either at the managerial level or the practitioner level what it shows up as is um, revealing a deeper sense of a deeper lack frankly of structural competency and an associated sense of inefficacy about how to address these structural issues so when I mentioned before food insecurity food deserts for example, in food apartheid. But I acknowledge it's not, it's not just healthcare professionals, it's also healthcare administrators and leaders who lack structural competency, who don't understand the ways in which these inequities that we're being asked to, to now report on and screen for and you know, address in some ways are really the down, downstream consequences of social arrangements and structures that put, that put some groups of people in harm's way. Understanding the structural kind of drivers of these things is something that requires us to re-socialize both medical ethics, ethics, but also medical delivery, right? We have to re-socialize understanding of what healthcare is. If it's biopsychosocial and yet we're not really familiar with the psychosocial part of it, well, we have to re-socialize our competent and, and improve our competencies to understand structural issues. And it's not surprising, therefore, when we see that there's a lack of structural competency, a lack of a socialized notion of what health is, therefore what healthcare delivery is that we should see these debates pop up is not my lane. Healthcare is just about making sure people get the best quality care and we treat everybody the same. Let us do our job, trust us. Even though all, all the evidence suggests that healthcare is, has done a really bad job at being, has, if anything, perpetuated inequities or allowed them to per per persist. Um, and that continues to this day. The, the reality is that without a structural kind of lens, right, uh, a lot of healthcare leaders and managers losing this lens um, throw these questions up there about is it in our lane? I'm not sure if it's our job, really, as a sign of something deeper. And when we interrogate this in one on one dialogues, it often turn into a little bit of like psychological counseling and therapy sessions with managers and leaders who are often courageous and doing incredible things in their day to day work. What we realize is that they necessarily they haven't necessarily had the time to step back and realize how these inequities they're being asked to address these outcomes that they're being asked to optimize are really manifestations of structural um, and social arrangements. And as they and then realize that they don't need to solve for all of that themselves, but they need to understand their role, either in leading partnering, and supporting at different levels. One very concrete tool we use to unlock a lot of this is a simple three by three grid, we call it the upstream strategy compass levels of prevention on the y-axis, levels of intervention, micro, meso, macro, if you will, on the x-axis. And healthcare is firmly in the bottom left, especially hospitals, tertiary prevention for individuals. And what we say is to provide the best standard of care and what you're doing in your box in that three by three grid, you've got to be able to understand and screen for social needs and then figure out how to partner with others in the community to address it. And as you start to do that, now see how you can connect in a structural kind of lens 
how to see what role you had to play you have to play to partner or support other efforts for example to address not just food insecurity for um, you know, a patient like Erlinda or housing instability, but now how to partner to address these other issues because you have a responsibility. If the DMV like provides access to doing voter registration, right? Like if there's nothing intrinsically democratic <laughs> about the DMV, if they can do that, right? If the DMV can provide <laughs> voter registration access, something that is not in their quote unquote lane, but makes total sense from a, from a um, population level from considering what we need in the democracy, healthy functioning democracy. Well, it's not too far removed to ask an institution that gets billions of dollars every year to start thinking about how to leverage their res responsibility now to start partnering and supporting these other efforts. If they lead it, um, that's, that can be problematic. And that's why the last point is about accountability. Who is asking these questions? And oftentimes it's not the people that matter the most. Erlinda is not allowed to ask these questions as much. And that's the last big point here. Next time this debate happens in whatever rooms that we're all in, um, bring your Linda in and then have the conversation about this debate. Because I guarantee you that the progressive lens, this transitional view of non-ideal is exactly what I hear time and again from the people who have long standing kind of, who have long borne witness to these inequities. And what they say time and again, and what I say time and again from my experience is to counteract this, to, to balance this debate, let's at least involve in a systematic way, the participation of those who've been most marginalized and asking these questions and then holding the systems accountable to do that. Because we can't allow hospital leaders to hold themselves accountable for answering these questions or being accountable for delivering on them. It just doesn't make sense. We would not expect police departments to be held accountable to hold themselves accountable for racial justice. Why would we expect even the most progressive benevolent hospital managers to be solely accountable to themselves to hold themselves accountable for this. We need community members and those most impacted to be part of these conversations and be part of accountability structures. That's a thank word. I'll pause there. I don't know if any of that stuck. Well, thank you so much, Rishi, for bringing in the structural perspective and also this more integrated model of care and questions of accountability. Lauren and, and uh, Kelsey, I wonder if you want to respond um, and perhaps uh, then turn from uh, from our panel to a couple yeah, of audience questions. questions before we have to close. We have some great questions as well. This has been such a helpful discussion. Yeah, absolutely. If I could ask Rishi one, I'd love to follow up. Rishi, can you just clarify for me? I think the lead partner support taxonomy is so helpful. And I was chatting Kelsey being like, we will definitely use that. That is going into the paper. In your idea of the ideal state, is healthcare consistently in one of those three roles or is it kind of issue and program specific? Yeah, I think we can expect, and I think there, we should um, make clear, clarify that there is a clear expectation that healthcare provides the best quality healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then in that pause and make sure that we're all on the same page about what model of healthcare we're talking about, biomedical, biopsychosocial, obviously I have a perspective on that. And I think the evidence bears this out. The other is that um, the related, the other thing that's worth clarifying is that, that, that the optimal delivery of healthcare includes, by definition, we should make it explicit, equity. And the reason that people are talking about these days is not only because of the uprisings and the social movements that have demanded, um, right, laid claim to power to essentially say, this has to happen, but also because of the, the additional kind of intrinsic logic of it. Let me, don't take my word for it, right? Right now, um, a couple months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, wonderful researchers, Sohas Gandhi and, uh, and a few others, wrote a paper that was analyzing um, various value-based payment models that CMS has put out over the past decade. And the evidence has been mixed as they rightly account for in terms of impacts on quality and costs outcomes. But what is absolutely also clear is that the value-based kind of payment models that are out there, which many people were hoping would be the panacea for all the ails of the pay-for-service system, especially when it comes to social risks and equity. It turns out those value-based payment models have actually been regressive, have actually in some ways allowed inequities to perpetuate or even worsen because they penalize providers that disproportionately care for those with social risks, or they, in other ways, um, have undermined kind of this, the, or exacerbated the structural inequities between healthcare systems that care for the poor and those that don't. Another, what they, what they concluded, rightly so, in this 
in this, this recent kind of this is what's happening right now. Value based payment is the thing. What they clearly say is if equity is not baked into the design and implementation of a policy, in this case, value based payment, it is not going to happen. This is a really important point. If you don't make every equity goal, inequity is a result. There is no sitting on the fence in the same way that even Kendi kind of talk, uh, talks about, you know, you're either racist or you're anti racist. There is no kind of <laughs> sitting on anti racism as a practice. Equity is a practice. And if you don't practice it, inequity results. It perpetuates. It has it's, that's what, how structures work. For that reason, I think that the as we clarify like what healthcare should do, in my opinion, you know, in terms of providing the optimal care and making sure that care is equitable, I think that allows us to have conversations around. Okay, well, what are the drivers of inequity? Are any of those drivers things that you're where we should lead is making sure a that you're as you try to drive towards equity that you stop doing things that are driving inequity. Do no harm first. So for example, are you, for example, um, uh, collecting data on race, ethnicity, language? We just had a conversation with providers in Flint, Michigan, the great you know, community organizations that were there. I just spoke with them at five this morning, my time. A lot of providers that we encountered in interviews and conversations there would, would say things just like well, across the country, like, well, we treat everybody the same. Why do we have to collect data on race, ethnicity, language? And our retort was, well, okay, great. I, I trust you, but should we verify whether you truly, in fact, treat everybody the same by collecting this information? We should lead by doing no harm, and that starts by actually verifying that, in fact, we are doing no harm <laughs> by looking at the data. The second thing is actually another way to do no harm is to stop suing our patients for Christ's sake, right? Like, we should stop like um, uh, harming patients uh, in terms of how we triage them into certain kind of services or others. In other words, there's a lot of ways healthcare can actually help, even in the most narrowly defined sense of the lane, help with achieving you know higher quality care and equity including looking at the question of social needs and social determinants by stopping the harm that we do uh, if you have an employer base of patient of employees excuse me that um, that has high, high deductible health plans and they work in your healthcare system right and most of your own employees now are experiencing food insecurity and you're only screening though for your patients because you're trying to check the box but you're not asking the questions about your employees about whether they're suffering from the same thing you're doing harm so uh, stop suing patients, don't put people into debt, um, which is, of course, one of the biggest drivers of, of economic kind of inequity and therefore, you know, health as well. So I, I think what we can lead is by starting in healthcare, just to acknowledge the structural kind of drivers of this and then being able to own the fact that healthcare has a role to play in doing no harm. And that includes also acknowledging the harm we have done. Cone Health System in North Carolina just uh, apologized a few years ago for their role in a lawsuit more than 60 years ago. Um, where they were uh, accused, and validly so, of discriminating against Black uh, residents in their community in Greensboro and surrounding communities. It took them 60 years to apologize for the fact that they, in fact, were doing that. I give them credit for apologizing. How many hospitals around the country, how many healthcare leaders who are debating about whether this is my lane or not are actually pausing and realizing whether it's in my lane or not have actually caused harm, not just in terms of racial injustice, but also social inequities. We in healthcare, might be causing more harm. And if we don't stop and acknowledge that, that that maybe is a good starting point. Thanks, Misha. Misha, I was struck, and I know that there are a few questions, so we'll, we'll go to them. But I, I was really struck when you were making your comments about the idea that saying, um, kind of saying it's not in my lane, right, as an argument itself is a symptom of our non-ideal world, right? where the biomedical model has maybe too long reigned. And so it's shaped how we organize and perceive the rightful types of practices that we ought to be involved in, you know, and demonstrates a lack of appreciation of structural determinants and the possibilities of a biopsychosocial model. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, it's kind of, um, at least it, it led me to appreciate in many ways the import of cultural change. And, and there are so many different things that need to, move, right? Little movements that need to happen um, in order for us to even be asking the right questions. <laughs> um, so I was, I was just wanted to thank you for kind of bringing that forward because originally I was thinking, oh, this is a little bit like saying, actually, this is the lane, you know, that kind of first thing that Lauren started with is to say there are two ways to address a lack of engagement, which is to say, you know, this is our lane, we should be doing this or, you know, to, to say, actually, sometimes we should be deviating from it. Yeah. Um, and, and I was struck by how the beginning of your comments, you really were pushing me to say, maybe we should be thinking about how to redefine the lane that is rightfully held 
rather than inviting um, movements out of it uh, in, in other ways. But um, it's also like, I think just building on that, Kelsey, I really appreciate that. And you're being very gracious because I think I was more curmudgeonly than I wanted to be. Um, but you're being very gracious in your <laughs> replies back. I, I think it is something though about um, asking like the question, well, who's asking, <laughs> right? It's not in our lane or, or who's saying that? And then unpacking that because it turns out like at least at the provider level, especially within the quadruple lane, there's actually more than enough of a, of a strong case to be made. And I've been making this now for over 15 years. When you look at the quadruple aim, excluding even equity um, as a consideration, so you know patient outcomes, provider kind of joy and resilience, and, and um, overall cost of care, um, and patient you know the and patient experience. As we look at experience, outcomes, costs, and provider experience, there's a case to be made. That's healthcare, right? That's the north star for what healthcare should be doing. And it turns out by not uh, at least asking about and thinking about how to integrate healthcare, which has now been in this last, in a generation, really, it's, it's been only in the past 60 years or so that we have actually gone headlong into a biomedical kind of model attached mostly to the healthcare profiteering kind of incentives. The structural analysis allows us to realize this is not a given. This is just a, a choice that we made generationally. It's also a choice that we can contest and perhaps, you know, start to reevaluate um, in this generation and next. The givens are that even in this kind of biomedical enterprise, we can make a case that just identifying and being able to think about how to lead partner support with others to address the social needs allows us to actually better achieve each one of those aims, these quadruple aims in our lane. So that's that's a big part of what we do. It's like, it's, okay, I'll, I'll concede your point. It's it's You're saying it's not in our lane. Well, what's in your lane? Oh, the quadruple aim? Let me make my case, <laughs> right? And usually that changes it around. What it reveals is a deeper sense of inefficacy, just the same kind of way, like I like the counterfactuals. So uh, Biden just announced a, a big moonshot, you know, big proposal to try to help galvanize the country to cure cancer. Is that in his lane? Should government be involved in curing cancer? The answer, of course, is well, yeah. I mean, there's a, it takes, there's a lot of factors at play there. But as we flip this around sometimes, what it reveals is like a deeper sense of like, it reveals the structural kind of, um, and the, the worldviews and paradigms that we hold more than reveals actually for me I, I think the question is interesting but the deeper um worldviews it exposes are more revealing right and worth interrogating actually i think you've done an amazing job of introducing a, a, a still broader perspective on the the question of what our lane was to start with which i think our kelsey and um <clears throat> lauren had already uh, argued that this was incorporated into their lane, but uh, broadening the sense of the structures and the other ways in which organizations could be acting uh, in lanes that are well recognized as their own in order to promote uh, more health equity. And so it's a, these are companion questions. That's not an either or by any means. I wanna really recognize that we have five minutes left and I think that I'm guessing that the audience uh, is going to uh, appreciate what they've heard. And I know that our, our uh, <clears throat> panelists have, have benefited from getting a quick glimpse of your questions. I'm gonna ask if uh, Kelsey and Lauren want to uh, add any concluding remarks um, and then we'll wrap up with about a minute on our up upcoming uh, programming for the year. Yeah, I'd pull out Christine Mitchell's question. I've been kind of typing some responses to folks, um, but you know, dear Christine Mitchell, <laughs> Rishi, you, I don't know that you know her, but she is the outgoing executive director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Med School and um, just a sage. So she asked, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Rishi, you know, we put forward this idea of having bifocal or progressive vision, but how do you think a person in the decision-making seat retains that ability to see normatively and ideal, like what the world should look like? I think she's saying like, when you're in the sausage making machine, like how do you not allow the institution to work on you in such a way that it dulls or erodes your ability to keep that ideal in view? 
Um, and yeah. I have a thought or two, but Rishi, you're like at this all the time. How do you do it? Yeah, three things. One is community, um, as with all things. So, you know, when I, this is why I started Health Begins, I felt like I was, this is 12 years ago and I was um, trying to find a way to keep that fire lit and that analysis kind of going, this idea of praxis informed by views of distributive justice and social medicine that brought me into this. And I found that it was really hard to maintain that kind of critique and that analysis and translate that into concrete practice in a biomedical kind of paradigm. Uh, so community helped me staying in touch with you know everybody that's on this line as well as others community second is uh, incentives the enabling systems we need to align the incentives to make th uh, this more and more possible and that doesn't happen without the third point which is accountability mechanisms both uh, there are opportunities to increase internal accountability through you know improvement methods performance measures strategy all this stuff of hbs i'm sure uh, and there's also mechanisms to strengthen external accountability. And that's what we're seeing happening right now. I mean, everybody from JCO to um, the AMA and others are considering new ways to increase accountability. Um, but mo the most important audience, and this is what Tim referred to, is making sure that the accountability mechanisms are available also to those who have the most um, on the line right now, and that's patients and people with lived experience. We need to strengthen mechanisms of kind of, especially of community-centered governance, because we can't rely on um, good, progressive, well-meaning, um, politically kind of you know, those trained in the philosophies of ideal theory uh, to be able to keep the fire lit. We also need to make sure that there are operating systems and that there's systemic participation of those most affected to make sure that uh, on their laziest of days, they're still doing better than they would um, otherwise. So community um, enabling systems incentives and then accountability structures um, from the community. Okay. The only thing I'd add to that in my take is um, I think we need as managers to announce our commitment to pursuing the ideal at the outset such that we create kind of a public commitment on that, that people can then come forward, as Rishi's suggesting, to call us out on, right? And say, look, when you started this three years ago, you told me that you were trying to achieve the ideal. Here we are three years in, you're still doing the same thing what what gives um yeah. and so it's kind of a point just about transparency but beyond that just being very intentional about what the end goal is lauren i'll just underscore that and say a big amen and really quickly and say we, we frame this as courageous leadership mechanisms of accountability are required and we i can go deep into that and but we re recognize in the past three years the people we love working with and people who reach out to us are courageous leaders they're in these institutions they're managers and ceos and frontline providers but they're trying to kind of walk this line between the ideal to, and the non-ideal. Um, that aspiration is part of the oath in some cases for some professions, right? It's part of what we're doing. And that takes courage. Courageous leadership is a competency and set of skills that needs to be nurtured. And the first way to do that is to recognize it and name it. Um, so I amen to your point. I would just kind of jump in on, on this particular point, which is to say that it can be really frightening to say that I'm going to commit myself to doing something that I don't know how to do or how to arrive at. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if the policy that I propose in this moment is going to get me closer and us closer to the ideal, but I'm going to nonetheless transparently state that that's what I'm going for. And I would connect it back to this idea of learning objectives, right, which is just to say that we might not have the capabilities now or be fully confident in being able to identify what about our policies are getting us closer to the ideal. But if we're not using that kind of statement to guide our um, what's important, then we will not be measuring, we will not be evaluating, and we will not be looking to the right kind of data to tell us whether we're getting where we want to go. Yeah. Um, so it's no guarantee, right, that we know exactly what it takes. But at the very least, it's a guarantee that we'll make an effort to learn around what matters so that we can do it um, perhaps ever better uh, over time. I so much want to respond to that as well, but I realize we're at time. Can we stand for another hour? <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to develop a green room <laughs> supplement for this, but I will say, first of all, really on behalf of everyone here, I want to thank the three speakers for the way you have ex thoroughly explored this question in dimensions that um, take us into different places in ways we aren't always used to thinking as practitioners in healthcare provider organizations. I want to thank the audience for the really profound questions that you asked that at least you have prompted further thought about. Um, I, I think that 
Our website will show our future programming. We won't spend time uh, detailing it now, except to say in January, we'll be looking at the ethics of design choices in the built environment, knowing what we know about the effects of some of those choices on patient welfare and patient behavior, and then at data ethics in healthcare organizations, drawing on a project that was a grassroots project initiated by data engineers when they were concerned about the ethics of their practices. So um, lots to think about this year and want to thank the audience for everything that you have contributed to our thinking in your comments in the chat as well as your questions and uh, hope to see you at future programs and hear more for me. Okay, thanks very much and good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks, Lauren.